I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. On June 15th, 1933, just a little over 88 years ago, at 8.30 in the evening, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra took the stage in the Auditorium Theater at the Chicago World's Fair. The concert was led by Maestro Frederick Stock, who served as conductor of the Chicago Symphony for 37 years, with the great concert tenor Roland Hayes advertised as the featured guest soloist. The program was called A Century of Progress and was intended to highlight the work and contributions of Black American composers by prominently featuring not only original symphonic works by the likes of Samuel Coleridge Taylor, but also concert arrangements of spirituals by Harry T. Burley and Hayes himself. The concert fell short of its aims, however, by beginning with the overture to In Old Virginia, by John Powell, a composer and politically active white supremacist who helped write the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, commonly known as the One Drop Rule, which classified anyone with African ancestry as Black, disqualifying them from certain legal claims and voting rights. That particular concert has long been held up as a beacon of progress, but on closer inspection, it didn't quite hit the mark instead throwing into sharp relief the difficulty faced by Black American composers and musicians trying to gain recognition and respect for their work. However, it did succeed in other ways. First, it introduced the world to the exceptional young pianist Margaret Bonds, who at the age of 19 made her professional debut playing John Alden Carpenter's Concertino for Piano and Orchestra and second, it marked the first time a major American orchestra would perform a work by an African-American woman. That woman was Florence Price, who had just recently captured the top prize in the Rodman Wanamaker contest in musical composition for composers of the Negro race for her symphony in E minor, a featured piece on the concert. Coincidentally, the top prize in the song category went to Margaret Bonds for her art song, The Sea Ghost. That competition, sponsored by the Philadelphia-based Wanamaker Department Store, was established in 1926, at the peak of the American Gilded Age, when philanthropic efforts by wealthy upper-class Americans funded a wide variety of artistic endeavors in an effort to establish an American artistic identity for the new century. For the judges of the Wanamaker Prize to recognize so early in its establishment the talents and skills of women composers might have signified an effort to sustain support for women in a typically male-dominated field. However, the success wasn't sustained much beyond their lifetimes. Only in recent years, since the discovery of a trove of Florence Price's previously unpublished manuscripts, coupled with renewed efforts by musicologists and journalists, and a desire on the part of performers and audiences alike to hear works by more diverse composers, has the spotlight once again found itself on Price and Bonds, who reveal themselves to be timely voices even nearly a century after their height these two women reached the heights of their profession while embracing their heritage as African-American women during a time when classical American music was struggling to define itself in a rapidly changing landscape. Florence Beatrice Smith was born in Little Rock, Arkansas on April 9, 1887. 
during the depths of one of the most difficult periods of racial tensions in America known as the Nadir. The daughter of a prominent dentist and an elementary school teacher, Florence began piano studies with her mother and showed an early talent for composition. She went on to study at the New England Conservatory, one of only a few music schools to accept black students at the time. She graduated at the top of her class in June 1906 with an artist diploma in organ performance and a degree in piano teaching while also undertaking studies in composition with the director of the school, George Whitefield Chadwick. After she returned home to Little Rock and maintained a private teaching studio until receiving an appointment as a professor at Shorter College, followed by an appointment as professor and head of the music department at Clark University in Atlanta. In 1910, she left Clark to return home to marry Thomas J. Price, a young attorney in Little Rock. The couple had three children, a son who died in infancy, and two daughters, Florence Louise and Edith. She continued to teach and compose while raising her young children and began to make a name for herself through competitions. In both 1925 and 1927, she was awarded second place in the whole Steam Prize competition sponsored by the Black Monthly Journal, Opportunity. In 1928, the Price family relocated to Chicago, likely due to worsening racial tensions in Little Rock. And it was there that she found an artistic community that would become vital to her success, namely in a friendship with the prominent social figure, Estella Bonds whose home was a hub for artists and writers of the new Negro Renaissance. She took advantage of the wide range of educational opportunities now available to her in that sprawling metropolis by attending courses at the American Conservatory, the Chicago Musical College, and the University of Chicago, all while continuing to compose commercial music and teaching etudes and maintaining a private teaching studio where she taught Estella's talented daughter, Margaret. At this time, she was also busy at work on her symphony in E, which would subsequently garner the attention of the Wanamaker Prize Committee and earn her the coveted feature at the World's Fair. In fact, she won quite a few prizes in that competition that year, including honorable mention for her symphonic composition, Ethiopia's Shadow in America, while in the piano category, she won for her piano sonata in E minor and received honorable mention for her piano fantasy number no. four. Her musical language is generally classified as romantic in style, but often subtly infused with traditional African-American influences, including dance rhythms and call and response techniques. Her catalog is estimated to include some 300 compositions, most of which are still unpublished, but they span orchestral works, solo works for piano, organ, and violin, choral works, and a substantial number of songs and spirituals, which were championed early on by the legendary contralto Marian Anderson, who frequently performed Price's arrangement of My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord in concerts throughout the country. In 1940, she was inducted into the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, known as ASCAP, solidifying her place as a leader among 20th century American composers. She worked tirelessly throughout her life, composing, teaching, and advocating for her work until her death in 1953. Subsequently, her works fell out of the public consciousness until a collection of her manuscripts and personal papers were found in an abandoned summer cottage in St. Anne, Illinois, just outside of Chicago in 2009. This discovery sparked renewed interest in Price's life and music through increased scholarship, more frequent programming of her work, new recordings and new publications of her compositions. Until Price, very few women had really made a name for themselves composing instrumental music at such a high level. But unlike her white counterparts, she had the additional barrier of her race working against her. Never before had a black woman attempted to make a career as a symphonic composer. Price believed that because of this, she faced resistance not only from white audiences, but black audiences as well. 
After a concert of her work for an appreciative but small audience, she wrote in a letter to a friend, quote, I have finally learned that the successful ones among us are usually recognized by us only after the white man has put his stamp of approval on us, end quote. Price biographer Ray Linda Brown points out that while Price was receiving recognition and performances of her work in Chicago, her goal was to achieve recognition and performances from the prominent orchestras on the East Coast. She knew, despite being very shy, that it was up to her to promote her own music. To her credit, she had deep confidence in her work, which fueled her persistence, even though she never quite achieved her desired level of success in her lifetime but she was pragmatic about her challenges. She regularly corresponded with conductors to program her music, most notably with Serge Kusevitsky, music director of the Boston Symphony from 1924 to 1949, who heartbreakingly, in hindsight, dismissed or ignored her persistent requests. She first wrote to Kusevitsky in 1935. She wrote again in 1941 then twice in 1943, with increasing frustration at the lack of response, yet never backing away from the reality of her circumstances. An excerpt of that final letter reads, quote, unfortunately, the work of a woman composer is preconceived by many to be light, frothy, lacking in depth, logic, and virility. Add to that the incident of race, I have colored blood in my veins, and you will understand some of the difficulties that confront one in such a position. I ask no concessions because of race or sex and am willing to abide by a decision based solely on the work of my work." End quote. Margaret Allison Majors was born in Chicago on March 3rd, 1913. Like Price, she was raised in a middle-class household her mother, Estella Bonds, was an organist and piano teacher, and her father, Dr. Monroe A. Majors, was a physician, activist, and author. Her parents divorced when she was four, at which time her mother changed Margaret's last name to Bonds to match hers. The house Margaret grew up in was a hub of Chicago New Negro Renaissance activity. Her mother often opening their doors to musicians and writers, playing host for frequent musical soirees. Like Price, her first piano teacher was her mother, but she eventually took up studies with her mother's friend, Florence Price, as well as composition studies with William Dawson. In 1926, she enrolled at Northwestern University, studying piano and composition. She first gained national attention as a composer in 1931 when she was awarded honorable mention in the Rodman Wanamaker competition for a solo piano piece titled A Dance in Brown. The following year, she won in the song category for The Sea Ghost. In the summer of 1933, she not only graduated from Northwestern, but also made her concert debut with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra at the Chicago World's Fair. She continued on at Northwestern for another year to receive a Master of Music in Composition in 1934. That same summer, she made her concert debut with the Chicago Women's Symphony, playing Florence Price's Concerto in D minor. In 1936, Bonds met Langston Hughes and thus began a long friendship and professional partnership with the prominent poet, beginning with a setting of one of his first poems, the Negro Speaks of Rivers, but which went on to include numerous songs, cantatas, and stage works. She relocated to New York City from Chicago in 1939, where she worked in theaters and as an accompanist and arranger while continuing her solo performance career. She had a fruitful relationship with the soprano Leontine Price, who commissioned her for spiritual arrangements, which she frequently performed in concert notably her popular setting of He's Got the Whole World in His Hand. Unlike Price, Bonds had more success getting her works programmed and performed during her lifetime, likely because she followed her former teacher's example as a tireless advocate for her own work. She clearly recognized her unique voice within the canon while being painfully aware of the challenges she faced 
as a woman in a male-dominated field. In a Washington Post interview in 1967, she said, quote, people don't think that a woman can really compete in this field. I could write a book about it all, end quote. Her music, mostly for voice, including spiritual arrangements, art song, oratorio, choral works, and theatrical stage works, is traditional in style, drawing on jazz and popular idioms rather than atonal and avant-garde styles, which were popular during her time. Of her position in the field of classical music, she once said, quote, I realized very young that I was the link between Negro composers of the past. You see, my mother was friends with all of them. So I realized that I was the link between these older people and the contemporaries. And now when I sit in Philharmonic Hall or any of those places, I hear the young Negroes today. Many of them are trying to reconcile atonality with the Negro idiom and they just don't go together. I think if anything, if I deserve any credit at all, it's that I have stuck to my own ethnic material and worked to develop it." End quote. She received the Woman of the Century Award from ASCAP in 1964. Bonds died in 1972, shortly after her oratorio, Credo, with text by W.E.B. Du Bois, premiered with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. One of the primary tenets of the New Negro Renaissance, the period in which both Price and Bonds were actively composing, was for artists to embrace their blackness and write about their experiences honestly and confidently, and sometimes quite bluntly. In a 1926 essay titled The Artist and the Racial Mountain, Langston Hughes, an artist practically synonymous with the movement, outlined his own artistic philosophy, which reflected this position, stating, quote, we younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too, end quote. Both Price and Bonds frequently set Hughes's texts, as did many of their contemporaries of all races, because his verses employ a lyricism and rhythmic style which has made him a favorite for composers. It seems likely that they both shared his philosophy as well, unapologetically infusing their black heritage into the music they wrote and reinforcing that heritage with the texts they set often choosing texts which embraced and celebrated the unique and challenging position of being Black in America in the 20th century, such as in our opening poem, Hughes's I Too, one of the songs in Bonds' Three Dream Portraits. At a time in American cultural development when classical music struggled to define and identify itself and largely ignored women, Bonds and Price rose to prominence despite the double obstacle of being both women and Black. They found a way to tell their story by bridging the gap between folk traditions and cultivated art. The fact that these women were exceptional in both talent and training allowed them to be successful enough in their lifetimes that they were able to make an impression on American consciousness. Although that public interest waned without their constant personal advocacy, the discovery of Price's lost manuscripts retrained the spotlight on them and their music, and we are all better for it. <laughs>